Um, so my name is Brian Hoffman. I'm the CEO of OB1, and I'm one of the founders of Open Bazaar. Open Bazaar is a completely decentralized marketplace uh, that allows anyone anywhere in the world to sell anything absolutely free. And by free, it's it's sort of a double entendre. It um, it means free as in there's literally no fees in order to start an account or sell anything or withdraw your money. Uh, and and also on the other perspective, it's free as in uh, there are really no rules or restrictions in terms of what you can do on the platform. Uh, the users actually govern uh, the development of the protocol, the rules and restrictions, like what what goes on. So. Uh, it's a pretty powerful idea, and uh, today I'd like to talk a little bit about how that future uh, is already here. Um, so, it's time to wake up, right? The world is a really crazy place right now. We're starting to see like everything be politicized. Uh, everything is, is, what ideology are you following today? Uh, who do you support? Um, you know, our, our, our human rights are kind of at risk, and it seems kind of odd, but many people are not even concerned and are not really prepared to defend them uh, properly. Uh, the, first, the first right that I think that is being threatened dramatically due to technology and the internet right now is freedom of speech. Now, we have a plethora of systems where we can go out and talk about whatever we want, communicate with whoever we want. But what we're not realizing is that companies like Facebook and Google and Amazon are using these proprietary algorithms to kind of shape our views to begin with. And so while we're allowed to speak freely and say whatever we want on these platforms, it's actually already been kind of shaped by what we saw on our news feed or, or what your friends were sharing and what they allowed you to see of your friends. Um, we actually saw an experiment I mean, I think it was a couple years ago, Facebook, where they made the news feeds explicitly negative for, for certain people, and they observed how they, how they acted on the network after that. And they would get depressed, and they would post the depressing status messages and things. And they knew that they could psychologically like, influence people by what they saw on the platform. Uh, this is happening also in, in commerce. Amazon has got an algorithm that observes how you interact even outside of Amazon what you should be buying and what you should be uh, reviewing. So free trade is another really important aspect of, of, your, free, of your freedoms. Uh, you know, I think every citizen of the world has the right to try and you know, better themselves, right? Through business, and whether it's making uh, shells, you know, <laughs> bags of shells to sell, or whether it's uh, cars. It doesn't really matter, but you should be able to freely operate that business and the, and the global situation is like very complex. Every jurisdiction, every country uh, has different rules and regulations for how you do that online. So first example I want to talk a little bit about is Twitter, right? So um, Twitter uh, has had a lot of controversy around how they handle the users on the system. Um, and they try to be somewhat hands off. Jack Dorsey, the CEO, uh, has uh, talk a lot about how you know he lets like Donald Trump talk freely. A lot of people want him to kick him off the platform. Talks about free speech. Now that's that's all great and well that the CEO supports that. But you know, I, you know, realistically, CEOs are steering the company policy. So if his ideology, his belief of the company's mission and vision is that those people should be allowed on the platform, they support that until they don't. So this change of conviction can happen at any time, which brings us to our next example. Shopify. So I, I don't know if this, this presentation may be somewhat US centric, so hopefully you'll, you're familiar with this or I can uh, help you understand this. But Shopify, which is an e commerce platform, uh, notoriously had an issue with uh, an organization called Breitbart, which is like a news network, uh, it's a conservative right wing uh, news network that got a lot of flack for being kind of, way, you know, wandering into the whole kind of hate uh, area, the nationalistic kind of viewpoint. A lot of people on the liberal side protested this um, and, and really came after Shopify and said, you need to kick Breitbart off of your platform because they were selling merchandise on, on Shopify. And Shopify's uh, CEO, Tobias Lipka, he published this blog post, which you can see is, is still published, not really, called In Support of Free Speech. 
And he defended the rights of Breitbart to sell their merchandise on their platform because it doesn't really matter, you know, it's a freedom of speech issue. But, as you can see, he deleted his story. Now, they reposted the blog post, to be fair, but they had a huge addendum that explained how their position had changed because this year, they had to remove gun sales from their platform. Now, the gun sales are perfectly legal in the U.S., but they removed them because of an ideology change, right? Like, that was too much for them. The Breitbart stuff, okay. Gun sales, not okay. So they changed it, and they published this quote, which I actually very much agree with. Solely deferring to the law in this age of political gridlock is too idealistic and functionally unworkable on the fast-moving internet. Technology is literally moving too fast for the legal world, right? The government doesn't even know how to control what's happening. Which brings us to our next, Defense Distributed. How many people know Defense Distributed here? Okay, just a few. So this is like a big, pretty big story in the US. This guy right here, Cody Wilson, he was publishing blueprints essentially for 3D printing gun parts. So if you bought a legal piece of gun under here, you could 3D print the rest of it and create a working firearm. And he was publishing for free the, the blueprints to do that. So anybody could literally download and print their own gun essentially on the internet. Now he was arguing that this is protected under freedom of speech in America. Uh, but, government doesn't know how to regulate that. I mean, when they wrote the gun laws, they didn't know, they didn't know that someone was going to be 3D printing a gun. 3D printing didn't even exist. So they've had to go through all these legal proceedings. And what came out of it was, the most recent ruling was, they, they stopped him from publishing these listings online for free. Well, you would think that would be the end of it. But his interpretation with his lawyers was, I guess we can't give it away for free. We'll have to sell it. <laughs> Information wants to be free, and we route around it, right? Well, how did he solve that? He used Bitcoin. He used Bitcoin. There's no payment processor going to allow him to sell these things when it's so sketchy, gray area, even though it's, I guess, loosely legal. Crisis averted. He set up a website. Now he sells it for Bitcoin using BTC Pay Server, free open source software. He sells it for Bitcoin. Crisis averted. So, how can decentralized marketplaces take this up a notch and actually expand this freedom? We want to give the power back to our users. Uh, in this world, no one uh, can properly police the world's commerce, right? Like we just talked about how it can get really, really fuzzy and the laws are super naive in a lot of cases. So, uh, how do we deal with that? eBay and Amazon have massive departments, legal departments that have to try and wade through all these, these uh, issues uh, worldwide. Every country is different. I mean, how do, you, how do you do that? It's not scalable, right? What happens is they just have a very narrow view of what's allowed and everything that's on the gray area or outside of it can't be challenged. You have no choice. And in fact, that changes day to day. Uh, on eBay, people were selling Bitcoin mining hardware a couple years ago. They removed it immediately because there was all this hoopla about whether or not Bitcoin was legal. They just removed all those people's businesses overnight. You woke up, all your stuff was offline. No more money for you. Centralized companies are always pressured to, to change based on the risks. Uh, you know, we, we saw that uh, recently. I don't know if anybody has been following like what happened yesterday, but uh, Shapeshift, which is a service that allows, you, you don't have to even create an account. You can switch your coins from one coin to another. Uh, I think everybody kind of thought that this was something that was questionable, whether or not legal. But to, you know, yesterday they announced that they're going to be requiring KYC for all their customers. Now, I have no idea why they're doing that. I assume it's probably due to regulatory risk um, for their business. And so they have to abandon that. That's what happens when you have a centralized business. This centralized marketplace can empower users to actually control this. Let's give the power back to the individual users. It's up to you. I mean, it's your business, right? I mean, if you take the risk to do something illegal, you should be punished for it. But, you, I mean, the whole marketplace shouldn't be punished for it. That shouldn't, you know, Silk Road, for instance, you know, they sold a lot of like legitimate goods. Well, I mean, a very small minority of the overall sales, but that majority of the sales actually caused the entire marketplace to disappear. So even if the technology was uh, useful, they didn't just remove the bad part. Instead of removing the, the brain tumor, they just killed the patient. In, in comes Open Bazaar. A little bit of a plug here, but you're going to have to suffer through it. 
So OpenBazaar, what is OpenBazaar? It's a desktop application right now. It's absolutely free. There's no accounts required. There's no fees to list. There's no fees to download the software. There's no restrictions whatsoever. It's up to you. It's completely community driven. We've been building it since 2014. Uh, it has secure chat with other users. It's completely end-to-end -end encrypted. You can, you can chat with your merchants and discuss what, your, what you know, the products are, ask questions, get support. It's open source completely. You can see every line of code. And, uh, and, it's complete, and, and you can actually help drive the expansion of it. So if you think there's something new that should be added, that you can be a part of that community and help shape what it becomes. And, and importantly, it's got a lot of privacy and anonymity protections. So you, if you are uh, very privacy conscious and you want to run it using Tor, you can do that. Um, and, and, and another you know, really cool thing is that when you purchase something from somebody, because it's completely end-to-end -end encrypted, there's no, there's no way, like I can't see what you buy, I can't look at how much you paid, where you sent it to, who you shipped it to, where it came from. None of that information is actually public to anyone other than the people involved in the trade. And so uh, it, it, it sides on the, on the user and the merchant's uh, perspective. Later this year, we're going we're gonna to be coming to mobile, iOS and Android, hopefully, fingers crossed. <laughs> and one of the coolest things about this is that a lot of people will say, okay, that's, that's interesting, but you know, the app store centralized, you're probably hitting servers centralized, all this centralized stuff. No, actually, the mobile app runs completely decentralized from the device only. There's no remote servers whatsoever. You are complete full node on your device, has a wallet, wallet that supports multiple currencies. It's going to support Ethereum, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Zcash. Um, we're going to be expanding that over time. Uh, and you can start, you can basically start your, your e-commerce store or buy in literally seconds. There's, there's no account registration. As soon as you start the app, you're up and running and you can uh, put Bitcoin or whatever into your wallet and get going. <laughs> so that's, that's going to be really awesome. And uh, so, I, I, like, I, like I said, fingers crossed. Now there's one caveat. I mean, these, we're all dApps living in an app world. Uh, app stores are centralized. There's no way around it. I mean, you can't sideload apps on, on iOS devices unless you jailbreak them. And on Android, you're at risk for man in the middle attacks and everything else if you start to do that. Um, it's, it's a very sticky situation. And as we see right here in this, this Coindesk article a couple days ago, uh, Apple even ordered Coinbase to remove digital asset sales from their app, which is something that we actually do and support within our app. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how the app approval process goes for us, but I think it's, it's, it's our uh, responsibility to try and pioneer and push these things forward and address these issues or route around them. I mean, we're not going to be able to avoid them. We're not going to be able to build these cool platforms without tackling these sticky issues. Um, you know, they obviously want to support their profit sharing model, and in this case, it kind of goes against that. So, uh, so what's next for Open Bazaar? Uh, Ethereum support, we're actually getting very close to finishing Ethereum support, uh, which will include a full ETH wallet. Um, we have some smart contract features that we're going to be introducing, we haven't announced yet, but um, we're working on it. And it'll allow you to basically do everything you can do right now with Bitcoin, with Ethereum. Uh, we're going to be working towards a web browser version. I mean, right now we're a desktop client, and, and nobody really wants to download a desktop client to just buy something. So we're going to be moving towards the web. It's a very complicated technology to build uh, because you know a lot of the things that are required to, to do so are not not there yet. Peer-to-peer right? -peer networking, things like WebRTC, uh, WebSocket communications aren't really built to scale to massive decentralized networks yet. Um, but we're working towards it, uh, and then more social. So one of the things that um, it's not as popular here in the West, but it's super popular in the East, is uh, this idea around social, this like WeChat type of model, where people are really interacting more freely with each other and, and doing business, and it's all kind of intertwined. Um, you know, the, the concept of Open Bazaar was always built with the with the idea that people would communicate with each other, that we've gotten to a part where like, I just get on Amazon, order my toilet paper, and I get off. Like, who knows where it comes from, I have no idea, just in and out, right, at the grocery store. But you know, in the times when bazaars were 
for starting, you know, hence the name Bazaar, you know, people went in, you negotiated, you talked with them, you learned about the product, you understood the origins of them. You